Good evening, everyone. I'm Joel Towers. I'm the Dean of Parsons, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight. Uh, as you all know, uh, Parsons and all of our schools are deeply connected to uh, the leading lights of design and uh, across the industries, and no more so than the School of Fashion. And I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you to the conversation tonight. Um, we, I will make some brief introductions, and I will hand it over to Simon Collins, the Dean of the School of Fashion, who will moderate a conversation uh, between our guests this evening. So let me get straight to the introductions. Uh, Simon uh, Dunin uh, is the creative ambassador at large at Barney's New York. And um, being an ambassador these days is risky business, uh, and uh, uh, no more so than at Barney's, though I think, of course, we could always arrange for uh, any kind of, um, you know, refuge necessary uh, here at Parsons. He's written four books, uh, Confessions of a Window Dresser, Wacky Chicks, a memoir entitled Beautiful People, and a tongue-in-cheek style guide entitled Eccentric Glamour. He's written regularly at New York Observer, The Daily Beast, and currently writes a column for Slate entitled Notes from the Fashion Apocalypse. Simon has won many awards for his window designs, including the CFDA Award, and in 2009 was invited by President and Mrs. Obama to decorate the White House for the holidays. So please join me in welcome Simon to Parsons. <laughs> Reed Krakoff is one of Parsons' most distinguished alumni. After studying fashion design here at Parsons, Reed entered the world of classic American fashion brands, began his career at Anne Klein and Ralph Lauren, and soon rose to the top creative position at other prominent design houses. Reed is known throughout the industry for his eye, his innovation, and his influence, and was tapped by the iconic accessories brand Coach to be its president and executive creative director. In his time at Coach, he has been recognized for revamping and revitalizing the brand's image as well as its heritage as an American fashion name. Like so many who study at Parsons, Reed's artistic talents transcend disciplines. He's also an accomplished photographer whose work has been exhibited in New York and Tokyo and appears in magazines such as El Decor, Town and Country, and Interview. And for those of you who uh, aren't aware of it yet, we will be honoring Reed. Uh, at our fashion benefit this year as our honoree for the year. And um, I've had the great pleasure of, of meeting with him and talking with him with our former president, Bob Carey. Um, and it was a, a tremendous honor for me to be able to uh, offer this to you and to have you accept it. And it's, it will be a terrific, terrific uh, event this year. Um, and so uh, without me taking any time from these distinguished gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to give to you the Dean of the School of Fashion, Simon Collins, uh, and um, I look forward to hearing some of the more made-for-prime-time conversation as opposed to what we were hearing upstairs before, but I'll let you allude to that. So, Simon. Thank Thank you, Joel. Uh, now, uh, many of you that have been to one of these conversations before know that uh, two things happen. First is we have sparkling conversation, uh, and second, you ask questions. Uh, and as you all students in the room know, that uh, we, we request and require that Parsons students ask smart questions. So do please think hard about what your question is going to be, otherwise I will come out into the audience and pick on some of you. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, I want to start by um, exploring when you first decided you were going to be a celebrated creative director and a celebrated creative director. Uh, you come from very different places, different backgrounds. What was that moment, Reed, first, when you thought, yeah, I think this is where I'm going to go? You need the, mic oh. you need the microphone. Got it. It's, it's, it's on already. It's on, great. Um, that's a tough question. I think... I think it was something that happened over uh, a few years. And I knew, I always had an interest in fashion. I had an interest in fine arts. Uh, I was, like a lot of people, was sort of a failed, or am, I should say, a failed painter, musician. Um, I went to Berklee School of Music for one, one semester before realizing that wasn't going to be my future. Um, I studied painting at the School Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And fashion was something I always loved. And... Um, but I didn't really know what my place would be in fashion. So I think, truthfully, um, when I went to Parsons, um, it was the first time I'd ever studied fashion in any way. And um, I started to realize what it really could be and what it would mean to work in the fashion business, that 
that it was this broad idea of many different experiences for many different people. And, um, you know, I think that was the first time that I thought, you know, this is something that I could really see doing. And I, I kind of never thought about again um, what, it, what it is, what do I want to do with my life. So I was really lucky to find that when I uh, got to Parsons and spent time with some people and I had an internship at Anne Klein when Narcissa Rodriguez was there. And um, it just felt like something that I kind of immediately loved. So for me, that was, I would say, when I really started to study it. And your brother, I gather, went to Harvard. That must have been a terrible disappointment to your parents after you got into Parsons. It was, actually. My, my father, I remember, famously said to me when I told him how proud I was that I got a job at Anne Klein that paid nothing, actually. He said, that must have been really tough to get that job. <laughs> So, Simon, you grew up surrounded by moon-stomping skinheads in Reading, in England. It's, that's quite a journey from there to, to your current and, indeed, long-term position at Barney's. How did you make... How on earth do you make that kind of leap? Um, well, I... My, my um, trajectory is different from Reed's in that I think I saw fashion as being a refuge, you know, because... Um, I grew up like uh, in post-war England, which was very grim, and my house where I grew up was very grim. I was, we were saddled with a lot of my relatives who were mentally ill and alcoholic, and it was extremely grim. So, and then what, I remember thinking, like when the '60s began, and images would appear in magazines, and somehow or other, I got the sort of message that in the distance you know, on the horizon, there was this shimmering world where you could look nice, at least, and not be mired in this incredibly dismal place where I was with the family, no offense. Um, so I saw fashion as being this, and I think this is true of a lot of people, actually, who end up in fashion. Fashion is this transformative escape that you go towards because you think, well, I can transform myself and not be of the milieu that I'm stuck in. So I hope that doesn't sound unkind. Um, but so I, uh, um, yeah, I was fixated and mesmerized by the idea of fashion, the transformative power of fashion, though obviously I couldn't articulate it that way at that point. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't, for me, it, the word fashion didn't necessarily mean anything much. I didn't have any grand plan or any vision. I just knew about clothes. There's clothes and I get a job in a clothes shop which is what I did. So I worked in a clothing store and, you know, in London, and it was groovy and people were transforming themselves. And then eventually I got bored selling clothes and I got involved in display. But I didn't really have a grand plan. I had actually very sort of um, pedestrian kind of ideas that the most important thing for me was to have a job. So I didn't care if it was in a crappy department store or a you know, to me, just to have a job, have a salary, to be able to buy something to wear on a Friday night, those were the key things that motivated me. And I got into retail. And then, you know, I, I was a hard worker. So I sort of worked hard and stayed in retail, still in retail. So it was more like that. I didn't really have... I'm always amazed when I talk to young people today, and you guys have a much more evolved, clear sense of where you're going, what you want to do. Mine was more like, I'm escaping, goodbye. There's the glamorous people on the horizon. It was more that kind of thing. Was that too long? Sorry. <laughs> so so as, you observe, as you mentioned, we are in a school and people are here and they're learning. What are some of the things you read? Perhaps you wish you'd spent a little bit more time concentrating on while you were in school. Well, actually, I, I, truthfully, I wish I could have gone for four years. Um, I think that um, as, time, as time went by, I wish I would have spent more time um, at school studying um, just really the fundamentals of, of design. I think it's a, a real luxury um, to have that background. And I really admire people that can do things with their hands and I really understand how things are made. And, and I think in a funny way, the, the older I get and the, more, the further along in the industry I get, um, it becomes more precious that ability to, cause, because it allows you to guide people, it allows you to understand um, what everyone's going through, it allows you to give direction, um, and it, it creates a sympathetic 
or an empathetic relationship with people you're working with. So for me, I wish I would have spent um, more time. And I, I had a four-year degree from Tufts and School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So I just couldn't see going for another four years. I mean, I think I would just be graduating about now, probably. Um, <laughs> and um, so I didn't. But I, I, truthfully, I wish, I really admire people that can drape beautifully, that sketch beautifully, because it's something you have forever, and it's something that really serves you forever. And it's something that I, I mean, my wife knows this every once in a while, I, when I have, which I never have any time off, but I, I would love to work um, you know, in a studio and really just go back and learn sort of the technical fundamentals of tailoring and pattern making. So that's, I think that's the one thing that I wish I had done. And Simon, what, what do you study to, to become a, the ambassador for Barney's? I mean, yeah. <laughs> The, apart from how to avoid skinheads in Reading. Well, um, Use the microphone. Oh, microphone, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I am glad. I, but the one thing I would say is when you're at college, I want, the one thing I regret is drinking so much and taking drugs. <laughs> like, uh, I did much too much of that, and it's not a good idea. And I hope that doesn't sound like I'm proselytizing old granny. But, like... Too, I did too much of that. But the one thing I did do is um, I was I studied history of art, and so I have a, amongst for for that and for many other reasons I have a very broad frame of reference, and I read a lot and I always did and um, you know so I have a very very broad frame of reference and I think what I think the internet is incredible and it offers a broad frame of reference, but it encourages people to customize what they look at. So you can end up having a situation, which I've encountered recently, where I'll say to somebody, you know, like Jackie Kennedy, and they don't know who I'm talking about. So, you know, you can end up, if you're, if you're only looking at the things that you're interested in on the, on the internet, you can end up with an incredibly narrow frame of reference, which is sort of a disaster if you're going to be a designer or a graphic designer or anything. So... Um, just keep that in mind because you can keep looking at Perez Hilton and this and that and Man Repeller and the sites that you like. That wouldn't necessarily give you, give you a, a broad frame of reference. So that's very important, I think, for a creative person. So we should cancel the Perez Hilton class then? Um, oh, totally, yes. <laughs> so um, it's a very tough business. You know both sides of it, and you, you're always subject to an awful amount, of, an awful lot of criticism throughout your whole careers. But you have to sustain yourself with the good bits, you know, with the compliments you get, or with the high points. Reed, what have been some of the high points along your career that you sort of think back and think, you know, maybe I'm getting a hard time right now, but I did do that. It's funny. I, whenever people ask me that question, I don't, I don't really have. I mean, I really love what I do. And I really feel lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And in, in a way, I don't see my career as, as having high points. And I mean, I definitely see some low points. Um, but generally, it's funny. I think loving what I do every day is the high point of my career, for sure. I mean, I've won two CFDA awards and a couple of Accessories Council awards. And to me, those are more... I don't know. I, I said this to someone in, in our PR department. I was nominated years. I don't even think I should have been. I won a year I didn't think I should have won. And then there were years where I thought I did really well and I wasn't even nominated. So it's hard to get excited about those kind of things. Um, for me, really, it's, um, well, starting my own business, I think, was the accomplishment in my career. And also um, seeing Coach after 15 years, you know, being a company that's the number one or two leather goods brand in the world. I mean, but it, it, it's not my accomplishment. It really isn't. I mean, you realize that with a company the size of Coach or any business that's, that's, um, that's in our industry, it just takes so many people. So in a funny way, I don't personalize the accomplishments. I really don't. My biggest accomplishment is that I love what I do and I feel, you know, that's something that, that I, that's mine and, and, you know, no one can take it away, a bad critic. And, you know, I've had my share of, of that as well. Um, they really can't take that away from me. Maybe that's somewhat of a defense, but no, I just don't feel that way. I think it does speak to that, um, that cliche that if you find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. You know, and if you do love it, every, and that's one of the great luxuries that the students and Parsons have, they're all here because they've got something they love to do. And so they're learning to do that so they can spend their whole life not working, you know, loving. Simon, um, so 
Barnes has done so many fascinating and exciting things throughout your tenure so far. There must be some things that stand out and you think, yeah, that was, I quite like that one. Um, well, when I started at Barney's, it was one store downtown, and we were sort of the underdog. You know, we were just getting important women's lines like Chanel and Alaya Valentino and building, you know, trying to build consumer confidence that we were a viable women's store and a fashion store and not the discount men's store that we had been in, 19, in the 20s and 30s. So we were very much... Uh, you know, the underdog trying to get attention, trying to make people say, hey, you know, it's not just about Bergdorf's uptown and Saks and blah, blah, blah. So um, one year I thought I was becoming aware in the 80s that people were becoming obsessed with celebrities. Um, and those of you, you're very young, but you're not going to believe this, but there was actually a time when people didn't care that much about celebrities. Like I remember the first time a friend of mine said, do you want to watch the Academy Awards? And I just thought they were joking because nobody watched it. It was like the most frumpy, stupid thing you could do and no one cared. This is like in the 70s and early 80s. It was much more about music and rock and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, wow, people are really, you know, Vanity Fair magazine, Interview magazine, they started to really push the idea of celebrity. And I was thinking, this is amazing. People are really engaging with celebrities like fans, just like they used to in the days, 1940s and whatever. So I thought maybe we should do celebrity-driven holiday windows. So I met with this great chick called Martha King. We made these caricatures. I think it was 1988 or 1989. And we caricatured all the resonant celebrities of the moment. And that was like Madonna, Margaret Thatcher, um, sports personalities blah, 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 blah. And we worked really hard on these windows. And I remember looking out of my office and the people were like 20 deep on the sidewalk and every camera crew in America was outside these windows. Pictures of them ran around the world in every publication. And um, the family that owned the, um, the company were just, you know, they couldn't believe it. And it was just by zeroing in on something that spoke to people like that. And I thought, wow, I earned my money this year. <laughs> That's good. So, um, so you two have known each other for a while. When did you first come across each other, and what was your initial response, Reed, when you first met Simon Doonan? Think about that. We right, were Simon. in an interpretive dance group together. <laughs> um. You know what I think we met? I actually think, I don't know if you remember this, we were on an Oprah panel for dressing appropriately at every age. I remember that. Were you the before or after? <laughs> it, was, it was not us. But it was, it was like a reality show, the group of people. It was Iman. Right. You, me, um, and we all, Frederick Fakai. Right. No. And someone else. That was when the first time we really met, I think. And we sort of agreed that the idea of dressing appropriately is just really obscenely <laughs> silly. And we that did. it was just... Um, I think we more bonded about, over that. Yeah, we were all like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they were all disappointed because they wanted us to support this idea that you had to be conscious right. of dressing appropriately for your age. And I kept saying, the older you get, the more insane you should dress. And <laughs> like, why should you become more inhibited as you get older? That's bananas. What are you talking about? And we all agreed on that. So uh, I just supported what he said. <laughs> I said what he said. But I think we've always gotten on really well because yeah. we have some a lot in common but also some very like the world that i've inhabited is a world of insane ephemera everything is completely ephemeral like um it was very hard for me to answer that question because everything i've done is eventually thrown into a dumpster and yes i have pictures of some of it but whereas reed um you know has an incredible design eye and is really an amazing connoisseur of art and design in a way that is um you know, antithetical to how I've approached it. So I enjoy that tremendously about him and to go to his house and see his incredible eye and how it's manifested itself. It's, it's amazing. I think you're being terribly humble, but uh, we'll come back to that. <laughs> so, um, Reid, you, you're creative in so many different arenas, um, not least with Coach, your own collection, with the photography. Uh, 
that's very challenging in terms of sustaining the creative process. And that's something that our students come up against. Like, where am I going to go to get inspired? What kind of things inspire you? Um, well, what's happened, I think, after a few years, well, a few years, I've been 25 years, I guess I've been designing. For the last good 15 years, I get inspired by working, actually. And um, the only time I ever do, like, an inspiration board is after the collection Frankly, when someone wants to, you know, they say, we need a picture of your inspiration board, and then I go do it after. Um, so for me, I, I'm a big believer in, in the process is what's inspiring, and that there's no right answer. There's no perfect color. There's no perfect way of starting. There's, it's all about execution. It's all about what you do with it. Um, so it's funny. I don't really spend any time thinking about that. I really don't. I what I do is the inspiration or, or what makes its way into my work is just whatever is happening right then and there. And um, I think it works if that's a process you're committed to. If it's not your process and you're used to getting organized first, it doesn't work at all. So it yeah. just has to be something that works for you. That, that, that seems to come up more and more as we talk to you know, people who have achieved great things in the industry. If you have to actually think about how you're going to go through your process, it's probably not the right process for you. It's something that you do because you have to do it. You know, it's almost in you. Uh, Simon, you've made some incredibly influential design decisions in Barney's, and things have come up there that have inspired, you know, globally, uh, the way that people do things. So you and you lead a very rich and varied life. Uh, what kind of things, I mean, where do you look for inspiration if you, if you have a dry spell? Um, I think from doing Windows so long, uh, you know, at Barney's I've been involved in the advertising and all aspects of the company's image, but Windows is a very strange, specific thing that, at least it was, um, you know, because they used to change every week during most of my career. So I've been doing it nearly 35 years. So, you know, I lived in L.A. for eight years, and I did the Windows at Maxfield. So that's like eight times 50 is 400 Windows. So, um, you know, you get used to just accumulating ideas, like you see a bag box of clothespins and you think they'd make a great wig and you sort of make a mental note of it and then you know it's so frantic it's like being having a weekly column which I also have had there's a real monkey on your back so you're 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 sort of gathering ideas all the time but the thing is um, wi window display in particular is extremely sort of forgiving if you do something that's a bit crappy or it doesn't come out right, it's gone in a week. No one cares. No one's keeping score. Whereas I think, you know, what Reed's engaged in, especially with Reed Krakow, these things are under a lot of scrutiny. They're timeless. They're forever. They need to have, you know, they need to be something your heirs are going to fight over. Whereas that is the delicious ephemera of window display is that n people aren't really keeping score. It can come and it can go. And that's probably why I've, I stuck doing it for so long, uh, in addition to the other things that I did. I was going to say, obviously, from my perspective, it's not that way. I mean, the thing about what you do is that everyone, it's a bit like advertising, everyone's an expert. And, you know, with accessories or with clothing, people have to kind of meet it halfway. You have to want to try it on. You want to have to get to know it. But what's amazing about creating windows is that people either notice them or they don't at all. Um, and you know what you've done by creating windows that actually people talk about is something that's totally an anomaly in that world. I mean, if you were to ask people to describe the windows of three, um, three retailers in the world, that's probably all they could come up with. So it's, it's just a different, you know, it's a different way of creating something. Yeah, I think uh, if you asked anyone, could they name someone that does window display? There's only really one person they would come up with. Wow. It's the guy from Bergdorf. What's his name? I'm kidding. Yeah, it's Linda Fargo. Linda Fargo, that guy from Bergdorf. <laughs> oh, she's not going to like that. <laughs> so, so um, Simon, uh, sustainability, we've seen it in the windows of uh, Barney's uh, more than once. Uh, it's clearly something that the store is concerned with. It's a huge thing for us here at Parsons. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, what role does that have in fashion? Um, I guess I'm always a bit skeptical about that stuff. Like Julie Gilhart, our fashion director, was a big proponent of the green thing and, and sustainability. And um, to me, it was always one of those things that I, because I lived in LA when they instituted recycling, so I always recycled. I thought, well, that's 
good. You know, it appealed to my obsessive compulsive side, cans in there, bottles in there. Like I never thought, I never thought that it made me a good person because I was doing it, you know. Um, so to me, it didn't quite have the, you know, Julie was a big proponent of it. And the first year she said, we should do green holiday windows. And I was, I said, what are they going to be like? A polar bear drown on a, you know, drowning polar bears. Like, what will they be? And then she said to me, "You'll come up with something." So we, I thought about it, and we actually did a great windows that year that I'm very proud of. And we did Rudolph the recycling reindeer, and we got all these Coke cans and made animals out of them. So we took the formats that are associated with the holiday and rendered it in a recycling kind of theme. So.、Um, I sent all the display people down to the the Bowery to just get re- old cans from homeless people, and they sit, they kept bringing these bags back that had like mice in them and roaches. So then we just went out and bought new ones and dumped the coke down the sink, which is hardly very green, but、um, yeah. So I I also feel that. Um, you know, Julie and I used to talk a lot about it, and she's amazing that she's managed to push this so much. But just FYI, clothing was always recycled. R- wealthy women gave it to poor women. Poor women wore it until they cut it up, and made it into dusters. It always had stuff. Always went to the goodwill. You'd never just see mounds of clothing on the sidewalk blocking the way. Like it had a natural recycling. So.、Um, I don't know. I think it's good to be aware of the environment and not screw things up. But for me, it's not. A, I'm much more interested in whether something's great or not. Because especially the clothing we sell at Barney's, it's all made in these fancy little ateliers. It's not reliant on、um, slave labor or anything like that. Does that sound horrible? But <laughs> Reed, what about you? I mean, Coach produces an awful lot of product. Uh, and you know, we, we everyone's looking around the world for the best resources and the best managed resources, etc. I feel very much the way Simon does about it. I mean, I think、um, it's a tough thing to answer because there's so many levels of of what it means to be green. And I think、um, we actually did something very funny on Barney's. What was the Barney's Blab? Barney, where you interviewed Babel, where you interviewed Julie. And asked her about her Louboutin carbon footprint.、Oh. I remember, <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> Still waiting for that. <laughs> the answer to that.、Um, we are. I mean, Coach. You know, we're very、uh, much committed in 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 our own within our own facilities to being concerned with the environment, and we do we do、um, you know keep keep an eye on that. But it's something that I think it's it's a slippery slope. I think people throw that word around a lot. I think most people don't know what it means. Um, My sister you know. is like dark green, green activist. She's a member of the Green Party. She her makes her, yurts. Her、right? and her girlfriend, yeah, they they don't buy anything. So careful with the green thing because the green movement and the anti-consumer movement overlap. So you don't want to end up in that bit where they overlap because you won't sell any frocks. <laughs> so you know, careful. <laughs> If you don't get dark green on me. <laughs> so I like that. So.、Um, Sticking with a, a perhaps a fairly thought-provoking topic,、um, what is the role of fashion? I mean, we've seen fashion in culture over this last week with outbursts around the world.、Uh, so, what do you think the? Ro- I mean, this is an open-ended question, obviously, but the role of fashion in modern culture. I mean, how important is it, Simon?、Um, well, I always tell people that because we get once in a while someone calls up and they say. Your models are too thin, or I don't like this, or I don't like that, or you're promoting something negative, blah blah blah. So I always tell people like fashion is this strange, perverse world that has its own engine, its own energy, its own, its own life force, and it tends to be perverse, twisted. Um, it is highly idiosyncratic. It's not a good place to look for healthy role models, normalcy. It's not, you know, you would never tell your children, yes, that's he- where you'll find a wholesome, healthy lifestyle. It's like fashion is intrinsically twisted. Like if you think about Elizabethan women wearing 
corsets with wooden slats in them and Victorian women putting white lead powder on their faces and all getting cancer. And, you know, fashion is not a warm and fuzzy place. And it, it definitely has its own strange momentum that you can't control. You can't suddenly go in and start trying to turn the dials and say, you know, designers should be using bigger size models or or, you know, whatever you feel like adjusting it, because it's got, it's its own weird thing that just keeps rolling. And um, I think it is central to the culture, but only, not, not in terms of the Paris shows, but in terms of what celebrities are wearing. That's what's made it central to the culture. Most, most people aren't walking around thinking, oh, well, what will Ray Kawakubo do next season? They're thinking about what somebody wore to the Grammys. They're thinking about popular culture. So. Um, I think if fashion has become central to the culture, which it has, it is via the cult of celebrity. And everybody now has a delusional kind of identification with celebrity. Everybody basically thinks they're a celebrity now. So they can, that is how they connect with fashion. You know, you get people calling up, can we borrow a dress? And they're, who are they? Nobody. Because everybody has this delusional identification with celebrity. And then fashion is central to the culture because of that, I think. <laughs> so, Reid, um, Coach is not uh, relying... Thank you for not asking me to follow that. Answer. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> nothing actually, more to say. <laughs> well, actually, I was going to say that Coach is not one of the brands that's reliant on... You're, you're far uh, grown out of the world of having to rely on celebrity endorsement. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have someone carry your bags, but you certainly don't rely on that to be the case. So, um, in, you know, and in some ways, as a, dare I say, a more affordable luxury bag line um, throughout this country and around the world, you're giving fashion, um, at least fashion accessories in the main, to people that didn't really have an opportunity to have that before. I mean, to have the new coach bag is achievable for a lot more people than to have the new, whatever else it is, French company bag. Um, so... I guess it plays... I'm, I should get to a question, shouldn't I? I guess it, it's playing a very different You're doing role. doing great. <laughs> a very different role in culture. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? I think... Well, it's a tough one. I mean, for me, fashion is much more kind of a mirror for culture. I see it as just the inverse of what's happening in, in the world. And, you know, if you look at wartime and boom times and times when... Um, you know, people are feeling good about what's happening in the world. It's all reflected in fashion very directly. Um, so for me, in terms of what it means culturally, it's, it's very much, you know, a window into the culture. I think it's the same with the art that's created during a certain period. It's the same with the politics that's created. I mean, people making decisions are impacted by what's happening around them. And to me, that's very much central to what's happening in fashion and art and politics and all those things. And, um, so for me, it's more of just um, a way to see, sort of a, to take a temperature of what, what's really, how people are feeling and what's happening culturally. Um, and uh, fashion has become big business. It's changed dramatically. We were talking about this earlier. You know, when I got into fashion, um, you know, almost, I guess, about 25 years ago, there were no such thing as public companies. There were no multinational brands. There were really, I mean, when Coach, uh, when I joined Coach, well, let's say, when I joined the industry, there were these purse shops, pocket book stores that sold these little private labels. They're all gone now. Um, it was not big business. So I think that's what you're seeing today in terms of all the turmoil in fashion. A lot of it has to do with the scale of the businesses. You know, they're multi-billion dollar corporations. They're of the scale of Nike. And Coach is actually bigger than Nike in market cap. Um, that changes how people feel about what's happening. It changes how people feel about the responsibility to be successful, to be financially successful, um, not just to be creatively successful. So, you know, I think fashion has evolved dramatically in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years and what it means um, and what it, I should say it differently, not what it means, but, um, you know, what it's setting out to do. Um, but in terms of coach and, and uh, sort of the question you asked was, how, how have we been, or how have we impacted fashion by bringing luxury to a, a broader base? I mean, I think that um, there has been sort of a homogenization of luxury in the last 15 years. Um, you know, true luxury, what it used to be was held by very few. You know, very few people would have 
what today is, you know, you go to Barney's and, you know, I saw two women in sweatsuits with Birkins. I mean, that kind of says everything about where luxury has gone. I mean, nothing wrong with that. They were matching. There was a powder blue, juicy couture sweatsuit and a pink one. They were probably men. <laughs> you were there, obviously. But it just shows you how, where luxury has gone. So, I, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't think people really, frankly, look at, um, a lot of people use the word massification of luxury. Um, the way you described it, I think people reach up that see Coach as luxury, and I think there are people that buy other bags that just love Coach and buy it. So I, I don't think those delineations between what used to be luxury um, and in what luxury is today really exist, actually. So um, you've both had um, pretty sizable careers already in fashion. Um, I mean, and you must have come across an awful lot of people, particularly uh, younger people coming out of school, starting on their careers, maybe a few years in. I'm interested in what things have struck you about the good and the bad that people do, because we're always looking for advice for our people who are about to graduate. You know, things they should do, things they should look out for, maybe mistakes that have happened that you guys have made, or mistakes you've seen people make. Uh, what kind of advice would you have? Um, I would say... Um, the media right now encourages young people, which is, I guess, you guys, to, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's an implicit thing that you must have your own company. That's the message I would get, I think, if I was a young person from those TV shows and, you know, young designers being vaunted and promoted. And I think, you know, if you have your own company and you're in your early 20s, um, it's going to subject, you know, if you have your own company, you're in your early 20s and you're even remotely successful, it's going to be so difficult and horrible and challenging that you're going to wish you waited a bit, you know, and, and I always tell people there's nothing wrong with going and working somewhere for five years or ten years and then decide if you want your own company. Some of the most creative, happy people I know are people that work for other people because to make money in the clothing business and um, to achieve the kind of thing that Reed's achieved with Coach and now with Reed Krakow. Don't underestimate that. It's like takes nerves of steel and, and it's immensely complex. So that idea that you must have your own label and blah, 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 otherwise, you know, I don't know. I would look at that more objectively. I think that's a, a fantastic point. I work on the Vogue Fashion Fund. I've been on the um, committee, it's a committee of about six people or seven people in the industry, and it's sponsored by Vogue and the CFDA, and I visit, one of the things we do is we visit many, many studios of people that are um, looking to win the scholarship and mentorship. And um, one of the things that occurs to me often is that people really shouldn't have started their own business so quickly. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way information flows now with the internet and with reality TV and exactly what Simon said, it, it's something that no one, I think it wouldn't even have occurred to most of the people that are starting their own business 15 years ago to start a business. It wasn't even something that people talked about. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's something that if you're not really ready, um, it can really turn you off. It can, it can really damage your career or it can make it difficult for you to go back the other direction. Um, I think there is something to be said for spending some time um, learning within a company that you really see how things are done, even if you do it entirely differently on your own. Um, there is something to be said for that. Um, but today it is all about having your own collection. I mean, I'm, I am the oldest young designer, I think. I'm, I started my own collection at 45. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm, I think that maybe is a little taken a bit too far, but... I do think that it, it was good for me at least to wait some time, maybe not 20 years, but um, I think it's, it's an excellent point that Simon made. That being said, the way fashion is moving, the appetite um, with the consumer and with the blogs, there has never been a time where people are hungrier for new people. So it's, it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. There's the opportunity, but at the same time, the risk is, is very public and um, it's very real. That does speak to the, um, the thick skin that's required. I mean, even, no, even at the lofty heights that you'd achieve with Coach, you weren't immune to, you know, to all kinds of people taking pot shots. So how do you toughen up for that? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a good answer, I like that. I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think there is one 
way to toughen up about it. I think the only way is to believe in, I mean, it's a silly thing to say, but you have to believe what, in what you're doing. And uh, it does hurt. I mean, I, you know, I read an article today about Stefano Pilati saying the same thing. I think all of us, no matter how much success, you know, people much more successful than me, it does, you know, it gets to you. But at the same time, you have to love what you do, believe in what you do. And someone told me early in my career, um, and I thought it was great words to live by, it was be happy to get what you want. Don't expect, one, people to be happy for you, and two, to get it the way you want it. And it was kind of hard, kind of a harsh way of saying it, but it was kind of, it kind of made sense. And, um, you know, it's a very competitive industry. Um, you know, people, I think, generally are good to each other, but it's competitive. So I think the only thing you can do is you can either say, fine, I'm going to let this person get to me, and I'm going to quit, or I'm going to you know, let it damage what I'm doing, or you can say it's going to make you stronger, and that's, I think it's the only way to deal with it. Otherwise, you kind of let them win. It is very sage advice because um, students here, of course, uh, enjoy criticism each week in class, um, time after time after time, and you have to develop this thick skin, and then they present their thesis and yet more criticism and then go out into the world and you know, either succeed or get ignored, but one's never immune from it, no matter how far. Uh, so we're going to be asking you to ask questions. So um, does anyone have a question? Uh, anyone care to put their hand up? Look at that. Can I? Oh, there's a hand over there. Yeah, I think there should be. There's a microphone. Would you mind? Uh... And if anyone else has a question following that, if they want to make their way to the middle and get ready with the microphone. So, uh, for both of you, um, what skills do you feel are key to to you to your success in your careers? And like, I'm sure that your jobs are both very time-consuming and demanding. So, how do you balance your personal life with the demands of work? Um, I think resilience is good, and having really low expectations. <laughs> so. <laughs> Then that way you're always pleasantly surprised, and um, yeah, and um, I never really th had. A, I always liked working because I always wanted, you know, a little bit of cash to buy myself some ICs, um, not ICs, but you know what I mean, metaphorically. So um, I never worried about working hard. I thought this is great. I have lots of work. You know, I'm busy. So. Uh, you know, being single, I guess, um, well, married, but not with kids, is what I meant to say. Um, maybe if you have kids, that's more difficult, the juggling. Uh, what would I say? It's funny, Simon and I really do share the love of work, I think. Um, I mean, the, only, the, the advice I always give people is there's never, you can never go wrong if you work hard, never. Always do more than you're asked for. Always stay later. Always get there earlier. Always take on more work. Um, you could never go wrong. And if you do, you probably weren't meant to be in the business, frankly, if you're working hard and dedicated. It's kind of, it's a good way to find out. Um, in terms of, I have four kids, actually. I have a few nannies also. <laughs> My wife is right here. But um, I think the, re the reality is just to keep a separation. And I, I think, again, Simon, whenever we see each other socially. We really don't talk about work, actually. I think the people that I find that are happiest and just my own experience is people that, that can leave it in the office um, and don't bring home sort of the angst. You can bring home the excitement, but not the angst. Um, it, can, it, can be, it, it can be challenging when you're just 24-7 dealing with the angst of the work, because it is a lot of pressure and excitement, but it can, it can really burn you out. Somebody, um, when, when Fashion Week starts, these journalists and bloggers all come up and ask me breathily, how are you preparing for Fashion Week? Like this, and I always make some hideously inappropriate answer. Like, <laughs> but basically, you know, if you have a job in fashion, you're lucky, right? And I said to this girl, listen, it's not like doing a second tour in Afghanistan. What do you think we're going to do? We're going to sit around watching a bunch of fashion shows, and ditto, if you work in fashion, yeah, you could be busy and driven crazy, but you're not, I mean, look at it in the global perspective, and, and then you won't 
complain. That's very sage advice. Yes, the next question. Um, this question is for Simon. Um, I know that Barney's is undergoing some change in management and things of that nature. How will that affect young designers? I know that you've always embraced um, young designers here at Parsons. I mean, Poenza Schuler is a great example. How will that affect um, young designers? Um, well, our CEO, Mark Lee, um, you know, he loves young designers. And so you guys just have to turn up the, the creativity and make it happen. I mean, it's interesting that people always cite Poenza Schuler. Why are we going back four or five years? Or when, how long would they, were they here? It was eight years ago. Eight years ago. Hello. We're waiting. <laughs> Where are the new talent? Where's the new Prince of Schooler? We can't keep yanking them out as a reference point. So I think any time you know, somebody new, somebody exciting comes along, you're going to find an um, enormous amount of excitement at Barney's. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, they were a bit of a unicorn, if you know what I mean. Like... Hoping to replicate that is, again, maybe you have to look at that realistically. That's sort of like a lottery win mentality where suddenly these two young students, you know, two minutes later they're in, in, in Vogue magazine, yada, yada, yada. That's not a scenario that's going to happen every season. So I think you have to be realistic about that too. But, you know, crank up the talent and you'll find always a lot of interest at Barney's. Amanda Brooks, our new fashion director, she loves young designers. Thank you. This is for Reed. First, how do you say your last name? Craig Okay, Mr. Craig <laughs> That's okay. I really like the New York Times styles, Thursday style section, but I was really disappointed with the way they approached your store review, with the way she said she wanted to hate it, which I found really unprofessional and kind of different from what they normally write. How did you respond and how do you respond to stuff like that? It's a, it's a good question. It's, um, I think it was the one time in my career, pretty long career, that I felt. Um, I actually never finished the story. I started reading it. I still haven't finished it. And it was just, um, you know, it was, it was something that I just felt came from a very kind of, uh, the going in thought was this was going to be mean. And, um, you know, it was actually pretty easy to dismiss it in my own mind because I just felt like this is not... I'm a, I actually embrace criticism. I think it's, we all need it. I see it as a way to get better. Um, but when it's so from left field, um, in a funny way, it's kind of easy to just to, uh, to dismiss it. You know, it's, it, it's never fun. I didn't enjoy having to explain to my team um, why this person, you know, because I still don't really know why. I've never met the person, but you know, it's part of fashion. It's it's you can never tell where these things are coming from. I had no idea. I knew that they came to the store. Um, I had heard she had a pretty good experience, but it was just you know again one of those things. I'm much you know I'm much more sensitive I think to things that are really about the work or people that know me as a person. Um, but you know it's never easy. But you have to go on. It, it's, I'm going to, in all seriousness, I actually said to um, someone I work with, I will frame it and put it in my office one day. Um, not yet. It's a little too fresh. But one day I, I will. It, it actually encouraged me. Um, you know, you have to. You, you can't let those things bother you. Otherwise, you, sh you shouldn't be in this business. Um, you know, everyone deals with those kind of things. And if they don't, you know, they're lucky. But most everyone does. Can I just follow that up with the, um, the opposite to both of you? Who do you admire and whose um, approval do you quietly feel quite, you know, you're like, oh, they kind of like that. I mean, it might be your family, I'm sure it is, but also, you know, maybe someone you admire creatively who, you know, they, they sort of give you the nod and you think, yeah, that's kind of nice. Simon. Um, I think, having been at Barney's so long, I'm really Methuselah, I'm so old, Having been there so long, I learned to understand press. And at one point, I was in charge of the PR department, and I really don't care about it. Like, I genuinely don't care about it. And I think that's something, as a, as a designer, you're not doing it to get a good review. You're doing it to make beautiful clothes. And uh, especially in this era now of comments, and everybody's, everybody's commenting, and everything has a comment box, and blah, blah, blah. You're not doing it so that you'll get positive comments. Like, I, I really, um, um, there was some recent sort of gnarly press about me 
in um, the Post. It was a full-page article. And I thought, oh, thank God. Because I would have been so upset if they hadn't written about me. Like, I would have thought, <laughs> shit, I'm not important enough to be dissed. <laughs> so I think I really, from years and years of dealing with it, highs and lows and negative, I, I don't take it that seriously. And, you know, I always think of Princess Diana, that poor girl who just every day would get up and look at the press and use it as a mirror. The press isn't a mirror, it's just some people going blah, 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 who cares? Unless it's, you know, funny. But outside of the press, people that you actually do admire, you know, it might be uh, designers or it might be friends or it might be photographers or anything else. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people that I know we all look up to in their own field. And perhaps if someone who we think is really good sort of tells us that we've done a good job, that can be quite nourishing. And certainly we, we, we would follow your line exactly. We encourage the designers, don't pay any attention to the press. But look You're for someone that does. You're lucky if they've been writing about you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But look for someone that you do admire. You know, someone whose opinion you do I actually value. I think it could be anybody. Like in my case, there's a bunch of people. My boyfriend, Jonathan Adler, he's a very rigorous designer with a very good eye. And he'll tell me... If he tells me, oh, that was really great, or this isn't good, or blah, 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 I totally trust him. Certain people, or if certain designers say, oh, I love what you did with our dress in the advertising image, like Albert Elbaz, you know, is a great, um, has a great eye, and that's a real compliment. So, you know, I think the key is not to try and win. It's not a popularity contest. You just have to have certain people that, that you rely on and... You think, oh, well, good. Like the other day, Carleen Surf rushed up to me and she said that she loved something that Jonathan had made. And, and I really think she's got an incredible eye. And I pulled out the phone and called him immediately. She loved your butter dish that's shaped like a shoe. <laughs> you know, fine. Because <laughs> he wasn't sure whether it was goofy or not or whether it's kitsch and da da da. And I said, it's genius. Carleen just said so. That's exactly the sort of thing. Yeah, yeah Reed, who, who do you. Listen to. Um, I think, again, similarly, um, I mean, I, to be honest, I think most of us would, it, you have to know yourself and you have to believe in yourself. And after actually the last show, um, actually before the reviews came out, I remember talking to the team and saying, it was great. No matter what anyone says, it was great. And I don't, you know, care. And we actually got very nice reviews. But um, you know when you do something. My wife is definitely um, my most critical. Um, and constant um, reviewer, you know, she'll just she'll sort of make a face if she doesn't like something, or I'll, I'll, I'll say, "Don't you love this bag?" <laughs> she'll just say, <laughs> I'll, get, "I'll offer her a bag," and and she just will not pick it up. <laughs> and I'll say, "Oh, don't you love this?" She's like, mm. like that. She does this mm, kind of thing, and um, or she'll be like, "I'm sure I don't get it," or "I'm sure someone likes it, but I don't like it." I think it has to be that for me it's the same again for most people. Someone who has a, who has a grounding and a, and an understanding of what you're trying to do, because it's not it's not a vacuum. What you're trying to accomplish is what you're trying to do within the context of what you're doing. So a person just coming down, you know, a sort of a random person doesn't mean that much. Um, one person that said something totally random uh, person was Bruce Weber who. I was sitting near at something, and um, we don't know each other very well, so I'm still not entirely sure he didn't think I was someone else. But um, not entirely. I'm pretty sure. He, I'm not sure. But he said, he said, oh, I loved your photographs of Stella Tennant. And I did photograph Stella Tennant for something, but I was surprised he saw them. Um, but that, that meant a lot to me because, you know, I've only been taking pictures for not even 10 years. And um, that, that I thought that meant something, you know. But it's it's again these people that understand what you're trying to accomplish um, and really get what you're about. You, this sort of broad based, either good or bad, is kind of meaningless. So another question from the audience? Yes. Um, thank you so much for sharing your personal and professional thoughts with us. Uh, my question is, I think, well, to both of you, being creative minds and creative heads, um, would you rather be working with people that are also very bubbly and creative as you are, or more a person that will follow more of your path and not give so many insights? Because I guess there's so many creative minds together, 
might result in a bit of a conflict. So the question is, would you, is, it, is it more welcoming to be with someone very creative or someone more conservative that, that will follow what you think? I mean, for me, it's having a big, I have a very big staff at Coach and a small staff in my own company. I, I think you always need people that are creative. You just have to be moving in the same direction. You have to be understanding what you're trying, again, sort of the, what's the intent of what you're trying to do? Um, are you all on the same page? And I think you have to, the worst mistake, and it's something I learned um, at Coach while well, we, we went from 500 million to a $4 billion company was trying to do everything. And once I realized, and it did take some time, I realized that I was only as good as my team. And now I'm just really, I, I'm really, as I say, sometimes like a brand architect. Um, it's incredibly um, freeing to realize that you're only as good as your team. And um, a lot of businesses that don't ever make it to the next level, um, it's because you can be a control freak, and I'm definitely that, but you can't be, you can't, try to do everything yourself. So I think that um, you need creative people. I would never want people just to do what I say. I, I rely on people saying to me, I don't think so. You know, I don't like that. When I have work that I know what I need it to be, I also need people that are, take direction. So you really need both. You need, but you need to really understand, again, what type of people you're asking to do what. You don't want someone who's extremely creative and doesn't have any kind of follow through and organizational skills to be carrying out work that you know it needs to be done. You know, but it's it's a combination. It has to be a combination. Um, I think what Reed said about all being in the same page, being on the same, getting on the same bus. Like, if you establish a mission or a strategy creatively, and then everybody, there's no limit to how enthusiastically people might engage with that as a group. You know, if somebody's just grandstanding and wanting to have their moment, and they're not part of the all going in the same direction, then that's a disaster and really annoying. But um, if, they, if they've read the mission and they've internalized it and they're all trying to achieve the same goal, then I would welcome their ideas and suggestions. Is that what you meant? What made you ask the question? I feel like there's a, something brewing behind it. <laughs> there always is. <laughs> no, just, just because... Um I don't know. I'd rather not expose myself so much. <laughs> no, just curiosity. Knowing that uh, too many creative minds together can cannot go, not sometimes not move forward. So you do need a leader, but then there's always in the team others that want to put their ideas and things. So it's just working with a team. So I think I think like having both um, sides and both kinds of personalities is what. Kind of That's why I think it's team. so important when I say, I, if I was you guys, I would want to go work somewhere first before I start my own company because you learn that rhythm of developing an intuitive approach to the situation. So, you know, you have to design X, Y, or Z. You get intuitively in the rhythm of thinking, oh, well, here's the designer. Here's she coming. I know she wants us to do this. Is she in a good mood, bad mood? How do we support the process and introduce some ideas without it seeming random and stupid and da 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 so that that's an important thing that you would learn in in a in a working context in a commercial context doesn't matter I mean if it was Donna Karen Anna Sui or Walmart you would learn that kind of intuitive rhythm of working in a group whereas you're not going to learn it on your own yeah it feels like the element of diplomacy is really key you know, you have to be wildly creative, but only when it's appropriate to be wildly creative. You know, when the boss has had a great idea and everyone loves it, it might be a good idea to support that. <laughs> might. <laughs> Thank you very much. So do we have any other questions? Yes, one more. So this will be the last one. Um, this was sort of touched on earlier, but um, I was wondering, this is to both of you, uh, how would you define luxury? Because in my mind, that definition has sort of expanded or changed. Um, so I was just wondering how you would define it or what luxury means to you. I mean, to me, as you said before I answer that, luxury has become a lot of different things. It used to be for the very few. You know, 20 years ago, it was a woman with a Birkin or someone with a pair of handmade lob shoes or a you know, custom-made suit. 
Everything, you know, to me, that's, it's kind of lost that essence of what it is. Um, I think luxury today is the coming together of, of design, construction, materials, in a contemporary way, though. Um, I think that it's that intelligent design is luxury to me. Um, there's, no, there's no exclusivity in the world. I mean, you can go online and see pictures of anything ever made um, in the handbag, the shoe the world, any of these things. And I think you can't do it any better. Again, for my own business, you know, I look at companies like Hermes, which I admire, but you can't be any more Hermes than they are. Um, so you need to reinvent it in a new way. So for me, it's that it's a coming together of what I call sort of a new craftsmanship, which is not a lady in a white coat with a sewing machine. You know, that's been done to death. And you know, there was one period, it was really fascinating. There was one period about six months ago where Gucci, LV, Fendi, um, there was one more. They all had people making things in their ads. And um, even one of the brands, which I won't say which, had in their window craftsmanship, quality, luxury, the words, actually. And I, I had this vision that they went to their ad agency and they said, you know, we want a campaign that talks about luxury, quality, and craftsmanship. And they literally <laughs> put it in the window. <laughs> they couldn't say they didn't deliver, right? So, you know, I think it's become sort of, it's cartoonish in a way. I think it's about intelligent sophistication of bringing together of intelligent design materials and this new craftsmanship can be expensive, not expensive. You know, great design is great design. So for me. Um, I honestly don't know what the answer is to that question. It's not something I'm preoccupied with. Um, oddly, you would think I would be because I'm at Barney's, but um, the fashion landscape now as compared with 25 years ago, fashion landscape is so huge and so complex that, <clears throat> you know, at any given time, you can get any, any look at any price, at any time of day, in any country, in any color. You know, it's like this infinite, incomprehensible landscape. And I guess, um, you know, uh, for me, I think, it's become more an era of um, self-expression to me. If you're able to express yourself, maybe that's a luxury. So that could mean you work in a car rental place and you make you know, 20 grand a year, but you're able to go to H&M and figure out your look and maybe you're good at picking up vintage at the flea market. I don't know. Mark Jacobs said, like, having your own look. It's about having your own look these days. So maybe that's more what it's about today rather than um, the idea of luxury. Because, you know, um, I would hate to think that luxury was just having a lot of money so you can go and buy, you know, a Reed Krakow outfit and a beautiful handbag and a Dell. I don't have a problem with that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, it shouldn't really be in this day and age with all the, op all the massive landscape of options and incredible clothing at all different price and Uniqlo and this and that and Lanvin and H&M and anything you want from the Goodwill if you've got a good eye and you can spot it. Like it shouldn't be just um, synonymous with money. It should, there should be something about creative expression. So I don't, I'm trying to sort it out. Like um, a few years ago when the fashion landscape started to become incomprehensible and so huge that it was impossible to keep track of all the trends, I said to Bill Cunningham, "What you know? It's so it's so crazy. What's happening? I don't even uh, you know. I don't even get it anymore." And he said, "Oh, relax, you know." And he said what you said earlier, which was, "Fashion is just doing its job. Fashion is a mirror of the culture, and our culture is this infinitely chaotic, massive, unlimited, incomprehensible, contradictory." area place where no one can keep score that's why I'm always very amused that people want to they want to say oh this is in this is out this trend has expired but you really can't anymore it's just it's too vast and too incomprehensible now what that does is represent an enormous opportunity for all you young people because you can f you can be anywhere you want on that landscape you can make handmade socks and make that into a huge creative business. You can do anything you want. There's no one can keep score of it and say this is good, this is bad, blah, 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 because it's too vast and incomprehensible. Is that incomprehensible? 
probably. <laughs> That was actually a fantastic way for us to end this conversation. So I want to thank Reed Krakow and Simon Doonan. Please give them a round of applause.